Hello, my name is Bill Scheel from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. I want to share with you the results presented in July 2015 at the Physiological Society meeting in Cardiff. The symposium was organized in order to address the following question. What are the primary differences between men and women with respect to the physiology of exercise? Before introducing the presenters and a synopsis of their perspectives, it is necessary to provide a definition of sex and gender in conjunction with a brief rationale for the symposium. The term sex generally refers to a set of biological attributes in humans and animals. It is primarily associated with physical and physiological features. Sex is usually categorized as female or male, but there is variation in the biological attributes that comprise sex. Gender refers to the socially constructed roles, behaviors, expressions, and identities of girls, women, boys, men, and gender diverse people. Gender and sex are, of course, interrelated, but for the purposes of these symposium reports, the term sex is used. It has been argued that, except for reproductive function, general, physio general physiology has been traditionally defined in terms of the responses of the typical 70 kilogram man. This sentiment applies equally to the study of the physiology of exercise, where many of the classic studies were performed exclusively on young and healthy male research participants. The reason for the lack of inclusion of female research participants and sex bias in the literature is complex and relates in part to historical, sociological, and cultural factors. Recently, important differences have been reported between healthy men and women with respect to the physiological response to dynamic exercise both in the acute setting and in response to chronic exercise training. There are, of course, many physiological similarities between men and women. Understanding potential sex-based differences is important to both the physiologist and the clinician scientist, as differences could impact upon exercise rehabilitation for patient populations, exercise prescription for disease prevention, along with our fundamental understanding of human physiology. In sum, well-designed studies comparing men and women have been few, and our understanding of sex differences in the physiology of exercise is incomplete. In our paper, we provided evidence to support the hypothesis that women have smaller conducting airways than do men, even when they are matched for lung size. This is important when we consider the principles of airflow, where the resistance to flow is inversely proportional to radius to the fourth power, and is of particular importance during conditions of high ventilation, such as exercise. Women are more likely to experience expiratory flow limitation, exercise-induced arterial hypoxemia, and have a higher metabolic cost of breathing for a given ventilation. However, many fundamental questions remain unanswered. For example, how are the previously mentioned differences in airways expressed in healthy aging? How does a high work of respiratory muscle work affect blood flow distribution in men and women? Hypertension continues to be a significant health problem despite recent advances in treatment. The risk of hypertension is elevated with aging and this appears to be more pronounced in older women despite the fact they have a lower risk relative to men until menopause. In the presentation by Dr. Hart, it's argued that the sympathetic nervous system regulates blood pressure and hypertension differently between men and women. For example, in healthy young women, the transduction of muscle sympathetic nerve activity into vasoconstriction is opposed by beta adrenergic vasodilation. In contrast, in healthy young men, muscle sympathetic nerve activity is balanced by variability in cardiac output and vascular adrenergic responses. With increasing age, there is an elevated sympathetic nerve activity, which is associated with an increased risk of hypertension. The loss of estrogen with menopause is linked with the decrease in beta-adrenergic vasodilation and an increased risk of hypertension in older women. Dr. Green reviewed the effects of male and female sex hormones on the human vasculature. It was emphasized that the impacts of aging and the interplay with hormonal changes and artery function in the context of the menopause and puberty. An additional emphasis is placed on those studies which have examined the effects of exercise training. 
Dr. Green argues that sex differences exist in terms of the impact of age on arterial function and structure, and that cardiorespiratory fitness modulates these differences. A final but important point is that there are a few well-done studies that address the question of sex differences on arterial function and the moderating effects of exercise on vascular function. Dr. DeVries summarized sex-based differences in fuel utilization during endurance exercise. Evidence for differences in each of carbohydrate, lipid, and protein metabolism were presented. The mediating effects of estrogen were discussed with a specific reference to a number of experimental approaches, which point to a modulating effect. The following question was addressed. Could sex differences in metabolism during exercise impact the response to training and dietary strategies aimed at improving health and performance? Women usually exhibit less skeletal muscle fatigue relative to men during single limb isometric contractions. Dr. Hunter presented evidence that sex differences in muscle fatigue of repeated dynamic contractions is specific to the task required. It becomes important to appreciate the velocity of shortening and the muscle group involved when making male-female comparisons. For example, with dynamic tasks where a sex difference in muscle fatigue is observed, contractile mechanisms are primarily responsible whereas reductions in voluntary activation contribute to muscle fatigue after a dynamic fatiguing task are similar between men and women. These findings collectively suggest that men and women do not necessarily respond similarly to training regimes that involve fatiguing contractions. Lastly, each review emphasized that there is a dearth of understanding of sex differences in the physiology of exercise. This serves to highlight the tremendous opportunity for further insight into regulatory and functional aspects of human physiology.